All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to this second session of the, uh, the UK Biobank uh, uh, Scientific uh, Conference today. And this um, second session is really about how, how, how UK Biobank, Biobank is going to be trying to democratize access as we enter the next phase of the uh, genetic uh, um, data generation for, for the project. Um, so I'm Thomas Keane. I'm the head of the European Genome Phenome Archive at the uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, and I'll chair the session. Um, so I suppose the context <coughs> for this session is that you know we're really entering a new phase of the of the, the genetic aspect of the project, um, where we're getting the availability of whole exome sequencing and you know quite soon uh, whole genome sequencing data. Um, and it's really this is really going to um, dramatically sort of increase the resolution of the genetic data that's available for the the resource. Um, you know there are many new challenges that this will introduce. Um, you know. I guess firstly is the the sheer scale of the uh, the genetic data that's available, and it really we have to think about you know how we make this data available to the community and and how it becomes accessible and uh, and and how you know different user profiles like be it from you know really highly skilled bioinformaticians, genetic researchers, you know to to sort of clinical investigators how they act will access this uh, uh, this vast sort of quantity of genetic data. Um, so in this session, uh, we're going to be hearing about some of the plans uh, for the, the UK Biobank uh, cloud-based platform for accessing this uh, genetic data, how it might be integrated with the other types of multi-omics data from UK Biobank, um, and and um, we're going to we're going to we've got three uh, really interesting talks coming up, and we're going to follow the same model as the uh, the last session where we'll try and keep the questions to the to the end of the uh, the session. Um, so first up, we've got uh, Dr. Mark Effingham, who's going to talk about the um, sort of describe the platform uh, overall, how it's going to work, you know, the motivations for it. Uh, and Mark is the uh, the deputy CEO of UK Biobank. Uh, he's got you know broad experience in, in technical strategy, IT delivery, and and real real kind of domain experience in the health informatics and big data sec sector. Um, so I'll hand over to Mark uh, to get started with his talk. Mark. Okay, thanks, Thomas. So I should say this session provides uh, an opportunity to share the steps that Biobank is taking to further democratise access to the resource, uh, and particularly to share exciting progress on the platform we are putting in place for access to Biobank data. So I thought I'd start just by setting out some context uh, and the drivers that are leading to this focus on further democratization of, of access. Uh, and I thought to start by just providing an update on the increasing use of the resource. Uh, Professor Watt touched on some of this in the opening introduction, where the resource is being used in, in increasing ways year on year. Uh, and this graph here shows the number of researchers registering to use the resource increasing year on year. And we now have more than 20,000 uh, researchers registered to use biobank data. Uh, that leads to a growing number of applications, which are similarly growing year on year. And we now have more than 2,000 approved applications uh, for access to biobank uh, data. One of the interesting things to note is over time, applications have moved from being quite narrow scoped hypothesis testing applications to now being much broader scoped hypothesis generating applications. But I think one of the most exciting aspects really now is about uh, the almost exponential uh, increase in the kind of insights and outputs that are now arising from those uh, approved uh, access applications. Uh, and you can see here the growth in publications, and there's now more than 1,800 uh, publications based on using biobank data, uh, many of which are in leading scientific journals. Uh, as well as the increasing kind of use, it's worth just reflecting on how uh, researchers uh, have changed their use of the resource and, and where they come from across the world. And if you look back to 2012, when access first opened, uh, applications were being received, uh, particularly from researchers in the UK, uh, from US and Canada, and from Australia. As this graphic builds over time, you can see how that's changed, uh, and particularly with uh, the availability of genotyping data in 2017, which is quite pivotal 
in increasing the visibility of the resource to researchers. Over that time frame, we now have researchers in many more countries now using uh, the biobank uh, resource. Uh, and this infographic just shows that change over time. And as of 2020, we now have more than three quarters of all new researchers registering are coming from outside the UK. So as, as such, Biobank really is now a uniquely valuable international resource for researchers to undertake uh, research in, in the uh, understanding of diseases of life. So this chart just summarises of those 2,000 or so approved applications uh, where that research is predominantly taking place, and I should expect UK is, is very much up there, followed by USA, but many other dog fees as well. Uh, and really our focus at this point, though, is on how do we increase visibility and use by researchers not using the resource today. So particularly researchers in those uh, areas of the world marked in grey uh, on this graph, um, such as uh, excellent researchers in India and Africa, who we don't have many, if any, applications today, and how we can make it visible to them to start doing more research with, with the data. So with that increase in, in use, there's also been a corresponding increase in the scale and complexity of data that is becoming available within the biobank repository. Uh, this graph uh, shows that quite, quite neatly. In terms of back in 2016, we set out a five-year view of where we thought the resource would be by 2022 off the back of committed scientific projects, uh, predominantly coming from the imaging project to image 100,000 participants, but also with the genotype and activity monitoring data. Uh, and as you can see from the purple blocks on the far left-hand side of this graph, we were anticipating being at a level of about a half a petabyte of, of data by 2022. What none of us anticipated was really the speed and scale at which uh, sequencing would be undertaken within the resource and what we've seen over the past few years with commitments by industry consortia, such as to undertake whole exome sequencing for all 500,000 participants and now also whole genome sequencing. The resource will grow to more than 15 petabytes of data uh, by the end of next year. Now, it's always dangerous to try and uh, forward cast and predict the future, but there is substantial interest in going into other areas of omics, uh, particularly around proteomics and metabolomics, and you'll hear from some of the sessions uh, later this afternoon talking about that further, and particularly around there is already a platform-based proteomics assay being committed. But we know there's substantial interest in also looking at uh, more discovery and targeted proteomics and metabolomics and where the availability of mass spectrometry data within the resource will mean it will easily grow to more than 40 petabytes inside uh, and will give a resource that research can go back to over time to generate new uh, research findings. So taken together, this increase in use and uh, increase in scale and complexity of data. Uh, it really demands a, a new access model. And as you'll be aware, uh, researchers today are able to download data to use within their own environments, and that model has worked uh, really well. However, the increasing scale of data really means we need to take a new approach to both data access and analysis. So whereas before, uh, we allow data to move to the researcher. We now need to bring the researcher to the data to allow them to undertake analyses uh, in situ. But a really key part of this is about democratization and how we make available the necessary resources that allow researchers in less well-resourced institutes or countries to be able to similarly unleash their imaginations to undertake analyses using the data, using resources that we provide uh, so that they can compete on the same scale as better resourced institution, institutions uh, around the world. So to do that, we are building a platform and putting a platform in place that will allow all approved uh, researchers to access publicly available biobank data, not just genetics, but the other data types, including imaging, uh, activity monitoring and similar 
and to allow them to undertake their analyses within the platform environment. Now, we've been working on this for uh, quite some time. We ran uh, a process last year to, to identify and select a partner to, to work with. And we've selected DNA Nexus as part of that process. And they are working with us now to build what we are terming the Biobank Research Analysis Platform, or, or RAP, uh, to put that in place for researchers to use in the coming period. Uh, as part of that engagement, uh, DNA Nexus are working together with uh, AWS, who are providing the underlying cloud storage and compute uh, that will power this platform going forward. So to give you a little bit of a, a kind of a teaser, a taster of what the platform will look like. So it's, it's going to be a browser-based uh, platform, uh, providing browser-based access to the data, but also an API and SDK-based approach. We've been working over the past few months with DNA Nexus to integrate the platform to buy banks existing technical services and particularly our uh, access uh, systems. And we're working to build the functionality and to make the platform accessible to a broad range of researchers, whether you're a, gen a geneticist or an epidemiologist, whether a bioinformatician or a clinician. Uh, the platform itself is being delivered from the AWS uh, London environment, uh, such that all of the biobank uh, data and any data derived by researchers from their analyses will be resident within the UK. We've taken a cloud-first approach in terms of delivering the platform, as cloud really is the only way whereby we can put in place scalable infrastructure that will support a, a growing uh, and a very variable range of analyses that researchers may want to, to take. Um, and one of the most exciting parts of this event is around uh, AWS as part of this engagement with DNA Nexus are providing a number of research credits which will be available to researchers in low and middle income countries and also early career researchers for them to be able to uh, use the credits uh, to effectively pay for any compute or storage they derive in order to support their research projects. Now, I can only give a very uh, poor imitation of what the platform is going to look like, but I did want to give a sense of kind of the features and functionality that you can expect. Um, here you can see, uh, obviously, a, a log on screen for access to the platform. There's the concept of project workspaces, which researchers will be able to use to organize their research linked to access projects, and will be able to collaborate with other researchers be able to share those workspaces with other approved researchers on their access applications. It's really straightforward to be able to set up a new project workspace, link it to their access application, and then dispense data into that project workspace to start to, to work with. One of the important things to note is that the biobank uh, data, I say the 15 petabytes by the end of next year, there will only be one copy of that data uh, and the costs for storage and management that have been held uh, centrally. Researchers will only pay for any compute or storage that they consume uh, as part of the analyses that they under undertake. Uh, within those project workspaces, there's a really nice navigation function that allows researchers to be able to navigate a full gamut of, of research data uh, within the resource and also some really good kind of housekeeping steps, which uh, nicely orders the data into easy to follow kind of folder structures uh, and all kind of labeled as you'd expect for analysis ready research, such as making sure all the files are in the right place and labeled appropriately to be able to run effectively things like link analyses uh, out of the box. There's also a, a very visual engaging cohort browser that again uh, helps to start to tackle some of the challenges that we've had in the past about really giving a sense about the scale uh, of data that's available within the biobank repository. So this is a visual way to be able to explore fields, to be able to build uh, filtered sub-cohorts based on particular phenotypes that researchers may want to define, and then to be able to take those filtered co cohorts through to downstream analyses.
One of the important parts uh, within the platform is the availability of a tools library uh, with a number of tools provided out of the box that researchers can use, uh, spanning from genetics through to imaging and, and similar. But another important part is the ability for researchers to be able to import their own tools and to be able to share those with other researchers uh, for use. Um, and there's a key aspect here about community engagement uh, and building a community of interest around the platform where we can start to have researchers actually importing tools, uh, sharing them with others, and the platform will actually grow over time in terms of a more powerful and increasing range of tools being available to, to all users. One example is uh, uh, the ITV browser that's available out of the box that can be used, quickly spin up, to look at exome and genome sequences in detail. Uh, another important aspect is the availability of Jupyter Notebooks, which is rapidly becoming the uh, tool de jour for interactive analyses of, of data within this platform environment. Again, one of the aspects that we are looking at is how we provide a number of kind of pre-rolled demonstration notebooks uh, that researchers can take and extend uh, to then start to undertake their own analyses. And again, this will be part of the community engagement side, where I think we'll see a large number of these notebooks growing over time. And, and of course, in terms of support uh, and enablement of the platform, there's comprehensive help and support features available to allow researchers to quickly onboard and become effective in the use of the platform environment. So I'm sure one of the key questions will, people will have is when will the platform be uh, available? Uh, and this chart sets out the, the timeline. You can see we've been working on this process now for quite some time. We are over in the right-hand side of this chart. The platform is actually already currently live in phase one. It's being used by a small number of research groups in support of the whole genome sequencing project. Uh, we are now moving towards an early adopter phase, which will run over the next uh, few months. And we anticipate the platform being generally available to all researchers by around the middle part of this year. So as a teaser taster and to go into a bit more detail, that early adopter program, uh, it is going to be invitation only. Um, we are looking to uh, identify researchers working on particular kind of use cases such as imaging analyses and genetic analyses that we can get feedback on platform functionality to cover that broad range of research uh, use cases. We will be continually developing the platform over time to support, uh, I say, that broad range of, uh, of research access. The next release of whole exome sequencing data, which will be for 300,000 exomes, that will be timed for around mid-year and will be coincident with general availability of the platform. Uh, and it's important to know that sequence data going forward, uh, partly just given to the sheer size, will only be made available through the platform going forward. Uh, as I mentioned, general availability will be in mid-year. We'll be providing more details uh, in due course uh, via both our website and via our access mailing list. Uh, but there is a link here and will be distributed in the chart material afterwards. Uh, for people who want to get a little bit more uh, insight ahead of time, uh, there is a website being set up and there is a really nice short video that you can explore and will give you a bit more of a feel of the kind of functionality that will be available. Uh, so on that note, we're entering a really exciting period. And that leaves me to say thank you and to hand across to uh, Thomas or Gareth. Uh, new advancements in, in data access for UK Biobank. Uh, I guess the old school bioinformatician in me was looking out for the uh, picture of the terminal uh, to appear somewhere there, but I'm, I'm sure it's, that's going to be possible with uh, every bioinformatician in the country uh, to book and down looking for that. Um, great. So let's, as I said, um, if you submit your questions uh, through the interface, and we'll come back to those, and we've got 20 minutes for discussion. Um, but otherwise, we will continue on with the next presentation, which is from Gareth Gregory. Uh, Gareth is the Chief Financial Officer for UK Biobank, uh, responsible for finance, HR procurement. Um, and he is going to give us an update um, on the 
you see, he's going to give us an update on the data access fees and the material transfer to transfer agreements and how, like, I guess, how that might work sort of in the context of the platform. So I'll hand over to you, Gareth. Great, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Everyone, thanks for joining this session. Okay, by Bags Access Arrangements. I wanted to talk to you today about a review of our access arrangements that we have completed over the past 12 months and really cover two areas in detail. Firstly, a new set of data access fees that UK Biobank will be charging for applications received from April onwards and reduced at the same time to our material transfer agreement. So firstly, I thought it was worth providing some context on the current access arrangements, which have been in place since access to UK Biobank data was opened in 2012, nearly nine years ago. Since then, we've applied a pricing model, which has emphasized non-preferential access, which is really treating applicants consistently, irrespective of the nature of their application. And a set of fees have been in place throughout this period that only seek to recover the costs of administering access in static over this period. Now, as Mark went through in much more detail earlier, since 2012, the value and size of UK Biobank's data has grown exponentially. By 2022, as Mark outlined, we expect a 60-fold increase in the size of the data that we hold versus our estimates in supply for funding. By next year, our data will have grown to 15 petabytes, a phenomenal growth facilitated by extensive investment in UK Biobank's resource over this period. But in parallel to this growth, our costs of administering access to this data have also increased and the current fees no longer cover the true cost of facilitating access. For example, we've seen that few in the three-year notional term initially granted, with the vast majority of researchers requesting access, which to date we provided free of charge. Nonetheless, this presents us with costs for longer that are not recovered. So as a result, we commenced a review last year of our fee structure to consider these changes in costs, whilst aiming to ensure that our fees remain fair, transparent, and affordable for researchers. Talking next about the results of this review. In terms of those results, we wanted to develop a fee structure which preserved the strength of the current structure, whilst also reflecting changes both in the data and how researchers are using the data. To provide a low entry price for access to base data, continue to enable access to regular updates of that data made available through scheduled refreshes of the showcase. We're going to continue to only recover the cost of administering access, not of generating them. We'll continue to individually cost sample access, recontact, and customize data requests as they are today. And we're also keen to continue to encourage applications from low and middle income countries and early career research through providing a reduced fee. So whilst these things will remain the same, the researchers use the result both now and into the future. Availability of the larger data sets and the higher cost to store these. And also the availability of the research analysis data through this. So we've developed a revised fee structure with three key elements. Firstly, data fees, which provide access to three different tiers of data for a single institution with schedule updates for up to three years. Secondly, institution fees to add an additional collaborating institution designed to recover the costs of putting in place an additional material transfer agreement. And thirdly, extension fees payable pro rata for each additional year of access beyond the initial three-year term. So the slide sets out the revised fee structure that we're now announcing. You'll see that fees are structured into three tiers of access, which includes the base data collected at part assessment and also health outcome data, key through linkage to health record data, and also so follow up through questionnaires too, which adds assay data, such as genotype data, 
hematological assay and other enhanced measures data set. And then finally, tier three, which enables access to all UK Biobank data, adding access to the larger data sets that UK Biobank holds, such as imaging data, sequencing data, and other large scale assay data. And the fees for these three tiers are structured in increments of £3,000. Tier one is a fee of £3,000. Tier two, a £4,000 in total. And finally, tier three, a further 3,000 on top of tier two, so a total of 9,000 pounds. These fees cover access to data for an initial three year period with access to schedule updates of that data. And once researchers have reached the end of their three year term, annual extensions are at one third of the initial three year fee. So we continue to seek ways to enable wider access to IP. And so I'm pleased to announce that later in 2021, we will enhance measures through the platform for tier one applications for no additional charge. These are the new data access and extension fees. The addition of a collaborating institution to an application will cost £1,000 for the same three year initial period, effective of the tier of data being accessed with annual extensions available for £500 per annum. noted earlier, low and middle income countries in early career research will continue to have a discounted fee of £500. But following introduction of the research analysis platform, this access will be through the platform where researchers can take advantage of the research credits Mark outlined in the previous session. The MRC have also indicated they intend to provide a grant to enable to fund those reduced access fees for low and middle income and early career researchers. And we're working with them to finalise those and to watch out for more details later. We're also introducing a new material transfer agreement. The current agreement has been in place since 2012 treating applicants to the universally accepted. However, there have been changes over this time that we now need to reflect in the agreement, which include changes in how the data is being used, with applications increasingly seeking to generate hypotheses through analysis of our data rather than test predefined ones, changes in access practices within UK Biobank, changes in legislation, including the introduction of the GDPR in 2018 and subsequent legal precedent, and finally changes in access technology with the introduction of the research analysis platform. Now, the timing of these changes provides an opportunity to reflect on over two years of experience in how GDPR is being implemented, and also pick up the implications of the United Kingdom's exit from the European Union early year. So many of the existing arrangement material transfer agreement it will continue to set out the obligations for the researcher to conduct the research, publish their findings, return their results. And it will also continue to provide researchers with flexibility, both in the timeframes for their research and also in the use of institutional data. There will be more emphasis, though, on compliance and also a focus on self-certification by researchers. But the main change will be more explicit on obligations for generated data, notwithstanding that UK Biobank in any event earning data. These obligations will ensure that UK Biobank can continue to provide data outside of the UK, both to the European Economic Area and beyond. And it will also set out that this must be through the platform. So I wanted to talk finally about how these changes will be introduced. We will be providing further information to registered research by email in early March. I think what's really important to note, though, is that existing projects will be able to complete under the current fees and MTAs if they remain within their existing term and current scope of data. To implement these new arrangements, UK Biobank will, will close applications under the current MTA on the 1st of April. An application freeze will then be in place during the process applications and changes 
received prior to this date. And any changes to existing projects will become subject to the new fees and will require a new material transfer agreement to be in place. Now, once the new structure has been in place for around 12 months, we'll review how it's operating to assess if any further changes or refinements are necessary. So I hope that's a helpful overview of the changes coming to the access fees and material transfer agreements from April onwards. For further announcements in early March, both on the UK Biobank website and in our emails to registered researchers. And I'll hand back to Thomas now for the next talk. Thank you. persist for the rest of the talks. Um, okay, great. So I see we've get, we're getting lots of questions. Please please keep entering the questions and we'll, we'll try and do as many of them as we can in the, the discussion session afterwards. Um, the final speaker we have uh, for this session is Dr. Jeffrey Reed. Uh, Jeff works at the, uh, he's the Chief Data Officer at the Regeneron Genetics Centre, uh, where he leads a team developing and applying uh, novel large-scale computational uh, analysis tools, systems and methods to produce and analyse uh, large genomic data sets. And I think Jeff is, is really going to give us a, a sort of a, an insight into this shift from a, you know, from from the sort of traditional HPC model to a cloud-first model, and, and really give kind of his sort of experiences of, of, of how how that transition has happened in, in his organisation, and you know, and, and how it's changed maybe how the researchers interact with the data, and you know, I think that will give an insight perhaps maybe into into how the uh, the, the UK Biobank platform uh, access will work. Um, so I'll hand over to Jeff. Have you got your slides ready to go? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's you know it's always hard to follow the discussion of MTAs and fees, but I'll but I'll try. Um, so so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I like to call go big and go home. The idea that and we know it all now with COVID, right? You can really transfer the world without leaving your house, and this is this is fundamentally what uh, these kinds of platforms provide for you, but. But let me let me move back to the very beginning because there was something that the Professor Watts said as she kicked off that that I thought was really resonated with me. It's this idea of of long term investment, the idea of making a commitment to an idea and really following it through to get to the conclusion that you know you can reach. But you but you sometimes have to slog through, and and this is really the story of Regeneron as a company. Um, you know, founded in 1988, it took us 20 years to get an approved drug. It, it took roughly 25 years before we had the readouts of business success. And so, you know, we also have felt this really strongly that a strong commitment to science and a, and a long-term view perspective as opposed to a short-term view is really necessary. And, and what that enabled us to do at Regeneron as a company was was launch this this kind of amazing thing, a very large scale genomic sequencing operation embedded within a pharma company. The idea being that one of the things that is slowing down discovery of new medicines is we don't have enough genetic insights. There's not enough ability to figure out what's going on with the genome to figure out how we can can create a new drug or we can uh, you know find a, a new likely drug target and, and so the bold idea was well let's participate in that instead of being on the sidelines waiting for other people to make key genetic discoveries let's build into our pipeline of development those discoveries themselves uh, and, and that's really the the fundamental idea of the regeneron genetic center which uh, here we are um which really relied on that investment primarily in terms of automation. So one of the things that, that Regeneron worked on over many, many years was automation in our mouse work. And so there's actually an automation team at Regeneron that helped John Overton and the group that built this fabulous lab that we have that does all this sequencing, build automated biobanks, automated lab prep, uh, of course, an Illumina fleet that's relatively push button. But then to the point of this session and this talk, um, pairing that with fully cloud-based informatics and analytics. That was something uh, that when the RGC was starting was, was not really being done by large-scale sequencing centers, which made sense because they had come up through the era when this kind of infrastructure wasn't available. And so, frankly, you know, those efforts were stuck using local hardware. But uh, by the time we came along, 
um, doing a fully 100% cloud first perspective uh, in large scale genome sequencing was, was really possible. And, and what that enabled with our partners, of course, because, you know, we are also, again, trying to partner with institutions that are committing to make long-term investments in building resources, building sample sets. So our, our first partner, the Geisinger Health System, you know, uh, was one of the earliest adopters of electronic medical records in the U.S. with data going back into the 90s. Of course, UK Biobank, and, and, and you all have heard today about the, the fabulous readouts of success of the long-term investments made there. Um, and so by building this large scale sequencing center, by bringing this automation so we can move really rapidly and partnering with other people with a similar perspective of making long-term investments in genetic discoveries, we've been able to do this rather amazing thing, sequencing about well, 1.4 million exons at this point at a pace of half a million a year and, and really uh, lots of really exciting uh, new insights into drugs and, and development. Um, I did want to point out that we also are completely on the same page with Biobank in terms of the democratization both of data and, and frankly, of, of genomics. So one of the commitments we've made is to try to build one of the most diverse data sets that we possibly could. So this is a map that shows uh, in, in pink our uh, the diversity of locale of our sequence cohorts, and then in yellow, um, some of the collaborations that we would really love to get off the ground and get going to increase both the uh, the, the partnership diversity, the, you know, our, our partnerships around the world, as well as uh, the genetic diversity of our resource, which of course is so important scientifically for making uh, important discoveries. Um, so so that's kind of the, the history of the RGC and how we got there. Now I want to turn to focus entirely on, on, on the cloud platforms of the informatics. And, and this is really just probably my favorite slide from the RGC. So in the very early days of the RGC, you see this empty room uh, with the cloud in it. Well, that was intended to be our data center. We didn't even know as we were initially planning the RGC that a cloud infrastructure was going to be workable for us. So, so we had as this contingency plan a data center. Um, and of course, you know, someone had the brilliant idea to buy a fog machine to put the cloud in the empty room, which then set off the fire alarm. That's a different story. Um, but we we got really, really excited about what could be possible with the cloud. And this is this is what we have now. So I wanted to show the sort of final state of what we had when we started there was not even enough bandwidth coming out of Regeneron to really utilize high performance computing in the cloud. So, so one of the first things that we had to do was get direct connects. We had to like actually, you know, dig a trench and build a much bigger bandwidth between us and the cloud because, you know, we wanted to essentially stream data off of sequencing instruments to AWS. Um, so, so getting to this final state uh, took several years, probably I want to say three or four years, but along the way, what we found was utilizing platforms like DNA Nexus, utilizing platforms like AWS and, and, and bringing um, these partnerships kind of on the inside of what we were doing really both helped us enable the diversity of users within our organization, right? We're uh, both a, deep biology company with many, many people who spend all of their time at the bench. And then there's people like me who, you know, I say I don't touch anything that's wet or stains closed, right? We we have to deal with the diversity of experience and, and these platforms not only are scalable in terms of what we want to do with growing our data sets and, and growing the perspective on how we're mining data out of our data sets, but but they also really are useful to serve the full diversity of users. People who want to just use a web interface to, to run a query and maybe get some insights into how many people have COPD and asthma, they can do that, as well as people who want to sit at the command line and, and write a, a, a really great new uh, bioinformatics tool um, that can uh, you know analyze uh, data at the scale you can find. So, the, the, the thing that I really um, wanted people to leave this with, and, and I'm sure we'll get into it in the discussion, is you know, change can be scary. So, what, so how did I learn to love the cloud? I, I, I also you know, have a background. My 
my physics background, I, I was doing a lot of computing in the 90s, right, in large scale physics collaborations, and that was all bring the, 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 the user to the data, so that's, you know, what I got used to, and then moving into genomics, it was bring the data to the user, and, and now we're moving back to that. Well, the thing that really justified it is, as we were working through the strategy uh, in the early days of the RGC, you know, we were predicting a, a two-year time frame for building the data center we wanted to build, and we had eight months. Uh, you know, the, the cost projections were tenfold more for the total cost of ownership of the hardware. That's everything from, you know, the guy who manages the networking on weekends to, you know, the rent you have to pay for the data center. Um, and as we learned very early, we had, you know, a lot of infrastructure uh, technical debt to, to, to overcome to allow us to really become a large scale sequencing center. So as I said, you know, we had to build this direct connect. The internal networks at Regeneron were insufficient to just move some of this data around internally. Again, you know, we were transforming ourselves from a, a really a hardcore biology company into a company that at least had this corner of, of really necessity of high performance computing and computational science at large scale. And, and, and so, you know, as as we looked at the pros and cons of cloud and, and local infrastructure, what we came to understand was it was incredibly expensive and difficult to try to stand up the kind of tools that we needed. So, you know, frankly, it was a no brainer for us. It was the only way we could have done what we wanted to do to, uh, to start out in the cloud. Now, again, you know, the timing was great because the, the cloud was right where we needed it to be when we were there. Uh, but once we had it in place, you know, the first thing we learned is, well, uh, you know, at, at Regeneron, we always think big and then bigger. And so even though we had been, you know, uh, endeavoring to do something like 20,000 samples a year, we were rapidly doing 200,000 samples. And the only way that that was enabled was because we had scalable computing in the cloud. If we had built local hardware, you know, we would have been back to a ridiculously expensive two-year exercise to build up another expansion of the data center. And most importantly, in, in thinking about the transformation that Biobank is undergoing, we discovered how easy it was to enable our collaborators with the data. We work with everyone from, you know, a, an Amish health clinic in rural Pennsylvania that sees kids that are very sick with genetic disease, all the way to, you know, some of the most powerful institutions of genetic research in the world, uh, from pharma companies to academic efforts. And so, you know, we have to be able to serve all needs. We have to be able to hold somebody's hand and, and walk them through, you know, what a genetic variant quality score means, as well as, you know, deliver data to partners, um, you know, who have very large scale infrastructure. This would not have been possible if we were trying to deliver our data out of our local infrastructure. And, and I don't know if people necessarily appreciate how much work and effort the Biobank team, particularly Alan and his team, have spent over many years to enable what Biobank has already done, which is frankly remarkable, to be able to make the data sets that they have available around the world. Um, but but this really is the future, particularly in terms of that really important aspect of democratizing data. Um, of course, the, the data management overhead, uh, let's just say a lot of my old job when I managed uh, on-prem infrastructure used to be managing storage because, you know, everybody thinks every piece of data they ever made is really important and you can never delete it. So, uh, you know, managing physical storage it can get really, really tough, make so much easier by on-demand storage and different tiering of storage uh, available with the cloud providers. And, and maybe most importantly, from a business perspective, it made it much, much easier to understand and manage and minimize cost. It's very difficult to actually understand the cost of a single analysis that you do within a given uh, local infrastructure, because the ways of figuring out what fraction of a resource you might be utilizing is, is quite difficult. But if, if you know, if you, want to optimize how you're deploying your budget and, and and manage your budget better, like the kinds of tools that are available to these cloud uh, infrastructures uh, are, are much better than the things that, at least in my experience, I've seen on-prem. So, so let me just wrap up with some 
kind of general opinions and insights and and you know we can then roll into the discussion um i firmly believe that if you want to maximize the impact of data you have to maximize the access to data this is i think been proven again and again and uk biobank is probably example number one of that uh in in terms of just the unbelievable uh utility of that has been created out of this resource uh, by having so many people, so many ideas, so many hands on. Um, so getting additional people, getting more diverse uh, collaborators, getting people with more diverse goals and backgrounds and perspectives, that that is to me the most exciting thing. The person who has had an idea but has never had the infrastructure or the training to ask that question that could answer that idea before, being enabled by a platform like this not only does it level the playing field, um, because of course, you know, some users want to download everything and if they have the resources, you know, they can do that. But if you only have a laptop and a low bandwidth connection, there's all, you know, there's kind of nothing you can do. And so I'm, I'm just really, really excited to see what the people who we haven't heard from yet are going to be able to do with this kind of data, which is, which is only enabled by, by platforms that can kind of solve this last mile problem of getting, you know, the user really attached to the data in a meaningful way. And, and, and that's, again, that focus on bringing the user to the data, which actually we're all participating in right now, right? We're all having a meeting from our homes. We've, we're bringing the, the attendees, you know, we're bringing the meeting to the attendees instead of bringing the attendees to the meeting, which I really appreciate because flying in COVID terrifies me. Um, but anyway, um, so, Obviously, more data requires more infrastructure. It requires more support and more maintenance teams. The, the, the team needs to grow in depth and breadth. As the data grows in depth and breadth. And this is why I'm really so excited to see Biobank endeavoring to, to move forward with an RIP model um, because, you know, as the data grows, the focus has to shift from data generation to data management. And uh, the management of the biobank data is what is going to really transform human health in the future and, and, and make all of our lives better. Uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly excited about it. Um, thanks, of course, to the patients and volunteers. This is really the testament to, to their uh, contributions and their efforts. And of course, the scientists and, and, and the collaborators who are working so hard, and, and especially Rory, Mark, Naomi, Alan, Leslie, and Huma, um, and really everyone at Biobank who is just really is such gracious, lovely people to work with. I just couldn't be happier. So um, that's all I have. Let me, let me hand it back and we can kick off the panel. Great, thanks Jeff. There's lots of really interesting insights into uh, this kind of mindset shift, I guess, that uh, you go through when you change to this kind of cloud first model. And great, thanks for that. Thanks for those insights, right? So um, we're gonna move on to the panel and we're gonna be joined by two additional uh, panelists. Um, uh, the first one is Professor Ruth Gilbert and then uh, Professor Gemma Hockwell. And I'll just give them an, op an opportunity just to do a brief introduction maybe and some thoughts that they may have, may have had. So maybe we'll talk to um, hear from Professor uh, Ruth Gilbert first. Yeah, thanks. I think I'd like to just echo Carrie Stephen Stephenson's uh, uh, phrase he gave in the previous panel where he said, Biobank is a gift to the world. And uh, it's going to be even more of a gift. So researchers will have much more data, much more complex data, um, but that does bring increased costs. Um, I think they're proportionate, and I'm really pleased about the special provision that will mean that early career researchers and those from low and middle income countries will will still have uh, you know low cost access. So. So Biobank will continue to extend its global reach. And as Jeff was saying, that's going to be really exciting and, of course, huge value. Great. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, shall we just hear briefly from uh, Professor Gemma Hopwell? Hi. Yeah, thanks. I mean, echoing again Jeff's comments, I think we're all really excited um, about this uh, transition to, to the new platform. And I think the whole community uh, will be um, really impressed and grateful for the massive investment that UK Biobank is making in ensuring that researchers such as myself that have been using UK Biobank for many years um, are able to do so efficiently um, and also bring into to 
the, the yeah, fold many new researchers with, with diverse backgrounds and from new parts of the world. I suppose three initial um, thoughts come to mind in terms of, of interesting things to think about. One uh, would firstly be the investment that uh, researchers that have been working on Biobank a while have already made in their data management processes and so forth, and understanding how they'll be able to synergize and then kind of bring that into the new platform arena. Um, really keen, was really uh, pleased to hear what Mark was saying around that the, the software availability that's really going to facilitate researchers. I'm genetic epidemiologist um, and we have lots of bioinformatic tools. It's going to be really important uh, that all those can be integrated into the platform really well. And also, I suppose, um, more and more research projects that we're undertaking are synergizing UK biobank data with other data sets and how the platform can really help support that process um, is going to be important for a lot of researchers as well. So they're just a couple of initial thoughts, but really excited to see where we're going and uh, the step change. Great. Thanks for those, those thoughts. Um, we have had a huge number of questions and I, I will do my best to try and uh, try and channel as many of those as possible. Um, I suppose the, I mean, the, 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 the real kind of overarching, you know, shift that's, that's happening here is, is essentially the, the access model and this moving to this sort of cloud model for, for accessing biobank data, which is, is probably, the, you know, one of the most significant shifts uh, since the inception of the project. And I guess maybe the question for Mark is maybe, you know, how do you see the launch of the platform and this new data access model sort of impacting on the overall maybe value of the UK biobank resource? I think we've, we've, we've heard from our First two panelists, so that that you know, quite positive comments that this is really a really a step in the right direction. Mark, do you have any thoughts on how it will impact sort of the overall value proposition from the UK Biobank? Sure, I, I think it should make it much stronger because actually we're providing a platform that allows researchers uh, to achieve more. I, I remember back to when we released the uh, the genotyping data, which is a, a small frame. We used to receive requests via the access team of researchers struggling to even secure a few terabytes of hard drive, let alone the compute necessary to analyze it. Uh, I think what the platform will provide here is uh, the basis for something that all researchers can use to uh, to really maximize what they want to do with biobank data. I, I think uh, we need to recognize this is a, a journey, if you like. Um, the platform we're putting in place is really good. It will um, evolve over time with increased kind of functionality, but it's in uh, our interest, all our interests, is to build a platform that people kind of want to use and that can undertake their kind of, uh, the broad range of analyses that you can do with biobank data. So I think it will be a process of uh, kind of continuous uh, evolution with feedback from the, the research community and that kind of engagement approach that I kind of described, where we have kind of researchers helping to almost... Uh, improve the platform over time, both through feedback, but also through the and importing of new tools uh, and, and, and similar. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, I will say that we've had a lot of really detailed questions about the platform, you know, things about APIs and, and real kind of, kind of nitty gritty questions. So I don't think we're probably gonna to get to those ones in, the, in this session. Um, but there has been quite a few questions about sort of people being able to export data from the platform, people being able to co-analyze or maybe import their own data sets into the, into the platform. You know, maybe this, you know, this, this, I guess the other sort of topic is, come up is, is people being able to maybe bring some portion of the data locally, perhaps to do some analysis in, in their own environment as well. Do you have a sense for how, how, how flexible the platform will be in, in that sort of context of bring data in and, and trying to get maybe some, some sort of data out? Yeah, we, we, we've tried to cover as many bases as possible in terms of the, uh, the design of the platform. Uh, and so there is a, the ability for researchers to import data. So if there are data that have been uh, worked on kind of locally, uh, either in, in like Biobank or other, other research, that, that can be imported to be analysed uh, alongside the Biobank data in, in the platform. Um, I, I know there's been a number of requests around kind of the change to the download model and a, we're going to move away from the download model altogether. Um, we're, we're not in, in the short term. I mentioned about the, uh, the genetic sequence data, uh, partially just purely as a, uh, an aspect of its kind of size, uh, and that we can't be shifting this kind of scale of the data around in the way that we have done previously. Really, the platform approach is the way that model would work best. 
But if researchers want to continue to download um, uh, data, so the phenotypic data, et cetera, uh, that will be in place uh, going, going forward. We, we certainly don't want to incentivize use of the platform uh, and say, I think this is something that will become more valuable over time through use by, by researchers. Uh, and we do want to get that model right. I'd say it is a, it is a journey. There will be some further development, and continuous improvement over time. Uh, but that's certainly the approach we're taking. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, I've got a question for Greg. Uh, everyone's favorite topic is uh, data protection laws and data protection in general. And, and how one question that's come up is, is perhaps do you have a sense for how sort of upcoming changes in data protection may possibly affect UK Biobank? I mean, I guess you you must have thought about this, uh, you know, it's at some level uh, in the, the project. You know, especially in the context of GDPR, Brexit, everything else. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right, Thomas. I think we've, we've given some thought to this, and this is really why we're timing now the, the changes to the material transfer agreements, because really that's designed to pick up what have been quite extensive changes in data protection regulations over the past two years. And what we're looking to do is pick up those changes and cast our eye to the future about what those might be within the next iteration of the material transfer agreement. So I guess our hope is that this review that we've we've talked through today will cover those key changes. Great. Uh, I think great. a key part of that, just, uh, I mean, just to add to that, Thomas, a key part of that has been our, our biobanks approach this from the very beginning in terms of the, the data that we provide for researchers to work on is, is de-identified data. Uh, and again, that's not changing going forward. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Um, just another sort of question related to the the, the platform. There's a lot of questions about the platform. So <laughs> sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm just. I'll try and pick off the kind of key ones. Uh, the sort of the sort of sort of uh, when you, researchers are interacting and using the platform, doing their analysis. I guess one of the questions that's come up is sort of the kind of stability of the sort of costing, so that they can kind of you know plan an experiment, get a sense for how much it would cost, you know, and not have it sort of going, you know going up or down in, in significant, you know, proportionally uh, uh, throughout maybe their, their experimental analysis. Do you have a sense for, you know, the, that kind of, you know, how, how will there be research to be able to plan sort of at a reasonable scale their, their kind of um, their costings? Yeah, so perhaps if I take that, the, the, we, we've done a lot of work with DNA Nexus and it's been a, a key thing in mind, partly uh, as part of this kind of shift uh, and change in working. Uh, and making sure that the the right controls are in place within the platform to provide signposting and navigation to researchers. So there's a very clear kind of published rate card around the different uh, compute types and instances and how much they cost, similar from a, a storage perspective. Uh, and then when you start to approach analyses, again, providing really clear indication about what the cost of that analysis would be based on how long it's likely to run and similar. There are also kind of limits in place that you can set so that you don't get things kind of running away with themselves. Uh, so again, there's been quite a bit of thought put into this. Uh, I know it will be an area of some concern for the researchers as they make that kind of transition. That's something that we have kind of baked into the, the, the platform approach. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, another topic that's come up a few times um, is the you know, sort of the being able to do the sort of multi-omics, multi-assay type of types of analysis. And I think you did mention that that you know much of the other UK Biobank data sets and assays will be available. Will be available. Is that will that be later on in the platform, or is that sort of in the sort of timeline of how the platform evolves? Have you kind of thought about that? In, in, when you say assay data, in terms of sorry, I mean the, 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 the other types of data. Sorry. The other experimental data types that you've got for Biobank, uh, imaging, proteomics, perhaps, you know, um, will they also be available through the platform? Uh, they, they, they will, yes. So uh, I guess in, in the short term, uh, the focus has been on the loading all the genetic data in alongside the phenotypic data. We're now starting to bring in the additional data sets. So for example, the imaging data, uh, both from the imaging project, the kind of MRI, DEXA, ultrasound, plus the baseline images from the likes of OCT, uh, plus uh, activity data um, for all the data sets coming downstream, uh, such as cardiac monitoring. Uh, and again, 
um, it, part of this kind of evolution is about ensuring the kind of tools and pipelines that researchers may want to use to analyze some of these data types uh, are available within the platform. So the likes of uh, kind of FSL, FreeSurfer and similar, um, how we make those available as tools that researchers can use. Um, we are anticipating having certainly the imaging data and the activity data, et cetera, in place for the platform becoming generally available later this year. Great, all right. All right, I'll try and, try and stop, I'll stop asking Mark so many questions, but um, there's quite a lot of interest in the platform. Um, I'll, I'll just a more sort of broader sort of topic. I mean, um, I guess for the other panelists, and, and it's really, you know, what, what do you what do you think as as in in your various experience and role? What do you think might be the greatest sort of challenges or barriers maybe for for using the platform? Do you do you have a sense for that? And and uh, maybe maybe Jeff maybe as uh, probably possibly has the most sort of experience in this kind of cloud model. I mean, do you, what were the most significant challenges? Maybe from the user perspective, but you know, also from when you were creating the platform. Yeah, the the you know the the thing I the thing I learned is not not every scientist is is comfortable innovating in every aspect of their lives. And what I mean by that is, you know, some people see a new way of trying to solve a problem and they get really excited to understand it. And some people are like, hey, you know, I know how to run this thing on the system I have. I just want to run it the way I, run. I don't want to deal with that. So the training aspect was the thing that that I really didn't project early enough at the RGC and we did struggle, um, frankly, quite a bit in some of the early days where, you know, we hadn't, we had we had the tools, we had the infrastructure, but we hadn't actually told people how they could effectively use those tools and, and what all the features of the infrastructure was. And I know, I know Mark and the team have planned a, a pretty rich program of training, but I think that's probably the most important thing. And it's not, you know, it's not one size fits all. It's like some people, you know, are, are going to need a, a lot more information about the command line because, you know, that's how they work. And some people are, are going to, you know, frankly, need a little little bit of hand holding even with the with the web interface uh, but if but if you want to really bring in these diverse voices and backgrounds then you know a, a rich training program that that kind of meets people where they are in terms of what they need to know that that's the piece that um, we didn't get as right as I would have liked us to have and I but but I think biobank is on a good trajectory there great thanks Jeff um, I guess same question to uh, to Gemma um, be interested just to get maybe from your maybe as a researcher your research group maybe do you have a sense of what you think might be the, the greatest the sort of greatest challenges to, to shift to this model and maybe you're already working in this model like Jeff I I, I don't know <laughs> um I think um no we're not working in this model at the moment um I think something that's going to be really helpful in terms of just following up on some of Jeff's comments is that I think this will create more of a community around not only sharing of the data, which obviously UK Biobank has been spectacular at um, over the years, but in terms of between the community. So with people developing uh, Jupyter notebooks and pipelines and different workflows for handling the data, I think because more people will be working in, uh, in the platform together, it'll really promote sharing uh, and learning from each other. So, so peer learning as well as uh, training from, from Central Biobank. I think that will be really pivotal to uh, making sure people uh, engage in the platform uh, and can use it uh, to the best of their ability. Great, yes. Any of the other panelists want to make a brief comment on this topic before we move on? All right, we shall move, we shall move on. Um, I suppose one of the other topics that's come up um, that's been raising the questions is, is really the, the possibility of, I mean, the power of Biobank is, 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 well, one of the powers is being able to combine it with, with other cohorts, other data sets, you know, to be able to do a sort of association analysis, combining your own, maybe, maybe slightly smaller cohort, you know, with, with parts of the Biobank, um, and, and being able to do that kind of integrating, you know, other cohort data. And I think that, you know, will the platform sort of evolve in that direction to be able to maybe talk to other platforms? Because I think we are seeing the evolution of, of multiple sort of platforms. Uh, analysis platforms, cloud analysis platforms coming as, as many of the other cohorts, like you think of like all of us perhaps, you know, are building their platform. Will, will that concept of having platforms talking to each other, uh, you know, evolve, I guess, uh, through maybe some of the standards maybe coming from things like GA4GH perhaps? I don't know, maybe Mark or Jeff maybe? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was just going to jump in real quick and just say, yeah, I think the data federation question is an important one, and and hopefully Mark has a really great answer. <laughs> I was hoping you heard Jeff. No, it, it, it is a really important point, and we uh, we, we know there's uh, increasing interest in being able to undertake uh, analyses across different cohorts to improve uh, kind of N, particularly in, in certain kind of research areas. Uh, and actually, one of the um, example kind of early adopter kind of use cases we want to look at is exactly around that. Uh, there are other things that we're doing as well to help you know, improve the approaches here. Uh, there's work being undertaken uh, by some research groups looking at making, for example, an OMOP uh, format version of the uh, the biobank data set, which I think, again, will be uh, kind of a really valuable addition uh, in terms of kind of harmonization between different uh, cohorts. Uh, but certainly this is uh, um, something we have in mind about how we ensure that the likes of, of tools are portable between different uh, platform environments. Uh, obviously, we spend time talking to the likes of all of us, team uh, and, and similar. Uh, and this is something that we're certainly focused on, looking at how we make this kind of work for the future. It, it may yeah. be worth pointing out too that the data federation problem is much harder if the users are all individually working in their own environments. And so moving to cloud-based platforms is probably a prerequisite to really effective data federation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's probably what I, I would say it's possibly one of the greatest challenges for genomics in the next sort of decade is really to get get federation working. It's it's the data sets are just too large to move and and you know jurisdictional restrictions, everything else that, that around um, personal data protection is uh, is driving this also. Um, one question. Oh, actually, I see that we have um, had a few questions around training and what sort of you know what sort of training might be available for for users who who, who will be new to the platform and how they interact with it. Uh, you know, different sort of the different sort of profiles of users, be it the, the more sort of users who want to use the, the Jupyter Notebooks kind of interface, the API, the, the kind of more high powered API users and, and maybe command line bioinformaticians. Mark, do you have a sense, have you thought about sort of training for uh, for, for the users as, as we get closer to the platform launching? Yeah, I mean, th this is one of the main threads of work between now and the platform becoming uh, generally available later this year is how we put in place the kind of necessary kind of training aids and similar. Uh, we, our, our view is to do it via a number of different kind of formats, such as uh, kind of webinar type sessions, as well as pre-recorded kind of content that people can, can kind of view kind of offline, as well as support that we'll provide through um, kind of the, the portal itself, if you like, in terms of documentation and enablement. Uh, so again, part of the early adopter program is to try and figure out what, what support is needed in kind of which areas to help uh, prioritize the development of that material. Uh, but that's something that we'll be looking to have in place for the platform general availability uh, later this year. Great. Yes, I think that, I mean, that, you know, clearly with this shift in, in how uh, the users will interact with the data, the, the training component, uh, you know, I think will be a, an important aspect. And maybe I'm like a, I'm a dinosaur, I can't think of, all I can think of is terminals, but uh, clearly it's, we have to move to uh, this new model. <laughs> to, 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 to your question before about terminal, there is terminal access within the, the platform environment. There's also a, uh, a published uh, kind of SDK approach, uh, which uses the DNA Nexus uh, DX kind of API. Um, so there will be some of the uh, much of the familiarity that you're used to today already. That's great news. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, yeah, the, I guess if you were to look, sort of, you know, if you if you were to, you know, sort of five years down the line, uh, you know, what what do you think would be, you know, how would you how would you sort of measure what sort of success would look? What will success look like for this platform if you're thinking sort of five years down the line and you know we've you know we've had the platform uh, for that number of years? What 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 will success be? I don't know. Probably Mark again. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> uh, so so I think it will be around um, uh, seeing people wanting to use the platform, uh, particularly. 
uh, increasing use by kind of research, for example, in low and middle income countries. Again, I think a key part of this platform and this democratization of access is providing the necessary resources uh, that allow kind of researchers all around the world to be able to interact and work with biobank data. So I think certainly a uh, usage uh, of the resource by both existing users of the data as well as new users, uh, but also um, seeing kind of real engagement in helping to develop tools uh, and sharing collaboration within the platform environment. Great. To, Thank to me, once, the, once there's a paper where I, I slap my head and go, I cannot believe I didn't think of that. Why didn't I do that analysis coming from, you know, somebody who hasn't been a scientific voice with this data before? Uh, to me, that's what success would be. Great, thanks for that. Okay, I think we're we are out of time. We're a minute over time. So um, thanks to all the panelists. This has been a really very interesting session. And yeah, watch this space. Well, you'll hear hear more about this uh, the UK Biobank platform as we get closer to launch. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to all the panelists. Thanks all. Hi, my name is Julian Mutz. I'm a researcher at King's College London, currently in the third year of my PhD. Together with Professor Catherine Lewis, I'm exploring health and aging trajectories in the UK Biobank. There are three main areas that we are currently working on. First, exploring predictors of favorable health status. Second, examining age-related changes in physiology in individuals with mental disorders. And third, comparing how objective and subjective assessments of health predict future health outcomes. As part of the first project, we examined multiple factors associated with overall health status. And thanks to the breadth of the data that the UK Biobank collected, we could examine relevant variables ranging from individual level characteristics, such as age and sex, to lifestyle factors, to psychosocial factors, including loneliness and social isolation, to environmental factors, including air pollution and residential green space. We are currently examining differences in age-related changes in physiology between individuals with mental disorders and healthy controls. This is an important area of research because individuals with mental disorders on average die prematurely, have higher levels of physical comorbidities, and may experience accelerated aging. What we found to date from this research is that individuals with depression or bipolar disorder differ from individuals without mental disorders on most of these measures, and the large sample size of the UK Biobank allowed us to detect even subtle differences. We found some evidence that changes in body composition, cardiovascular function, lung function, and bone mineral density followed different trajectories with age in individuals with depression. These differences did not uniformly narrow or widen with age. For example, we observed that differences in body mass index in females narrowed with age while differences in blood pressure generally widened with age. This research helps us better understand heterogeneity in aging trajectories, and given that variation in these physiological measures is linked to morbidity and mortality, is of obvious public health importance. Finally, I'm currently exploring how different health indicators that assessed at baseline, especially subjective and objective assessments of health, predict all-cause mortality and leading causes of death in the UK. 
This research is possible thanks to the extensive record linkage to hospital, primary care, and death records. The UK Biobank represents a truly unprecedented data resource to examine health and aging trajectories and is immensely valuable to researchers from so many disciplines. I would like to thank everyone who has helped set up the UK Biobank, all participants who have provided so much of their personal data and time, and of course the UK Biobank staff, especially the access management team, who have been incredibly helpful in making these data so widely accessible.